Uh, I am Pam Holland, and as John said, I, my company is Tech Moxie, and we coach and teach technology. I kind of joke that we teach to grown-ups. Uh, one interesting observation is in the past, I would say, six months, our clients have been trending younger. I always joke that I'd be out of business in a few years when you know the up and coming baby boomers who were all comfortable with technology would no longer need our services. But what we're finding is that younger people, and I'm not talking about 20 year olds, but I am talking about perhaps 40 and 50 year olds, are now using technology more and more in their businesses in new ways. And a lot of it's social media. So that was a, a big surprise to me. And, and I have to say people, it's not that they couldn't figure out how to use a Twitter or Facebook, but the amount of time it takes to dive into all of those different features ends up being too time consuming. So that's just an, an observation because I'm really also very fascinated by the trends in, in who's using technology and how they're using it. Um, if I was in front of a live audience, I would be encouraging questions along the way. I know that's not as practical with um, an online presentation, but I will say I try very hard not to use lingo that I haven't explained. So if I throw in a term um, that doesn't make any sense, you need a little clarification that's you know, relevant and going to make everything else harder to understand, use the chat box and hopefully John will be able to kind of filter those and let me know if there's something, something there. All right. So I'm going to go through um, some general high level overview of social media, as well as do, a, I won't say a total deep dive given our time, but a dive into some of uh, the specific social media apps that we all hear about a lot. And I'm going to start with a story. And the reason I want to start with this story is social media has really been very stressful for people lately, whether, you know, the political scene or fake news spreading. Um, it, it's just been um, kind of fraught. So I am an optimist. I am not such an optimist that I think everyone in the world should also be an optimist and be on social media. I think it's a very, very personal decision. So I'm really not here to proselytize, but I would like to start with just showing a wonderful story that only happened because of social media. And like many, I'm, I'm fascinated by twins separated birth and twin stories. So here's a story of two girls, uh, Anais and Samantha, who I'll tell you the punchline is they are identical twins, but did not know that each had a twin. They were adopted from South Korea out of an orphanage. Anais was adopted, to, uh, adopted into a family in Paris and Samantha ended up in New Jersey. Now I could make a Jersey joke, but I'm from Jersey, so I'm not gonna do that. But Samantha looks happy despite her, her New Jersey roots. So what happened is, is that these twins found each other on social media. And these are the different social media sites that they either found themselves through or used as they were getting to know each other. So I'll go through this and explain what happened. So here's Samantha. Samantha's very extroverted. She's an actress. And like many kids, she likes to make or liked to make YouTube videos. Some of them were skits. Some of them were her singing or acting or being funny. And she had something of a following, I think, because she had a, a bit part in a movie. She moved to LA and this was going to be her career. So Samantha is on YouTube, which is, you know, just a little explanation. YouTube, you upload videos and anyone, generally anyone can see them. And so there are people who become celebrities just because they upload their videos to YouTube. So what had happened is um, Anais's friends, I don't know quite where they were, whether they were in Paris or France, saw the videos of Samantha and were really taken by how much they looked alike. So Aeneas, as friends, sent her a copy of the video and said, there's this girl named Samantha. She's on YouTube and she looks just like you. And here you can see a picture. This is probably not the one where they look the most identical, but this is something that they posted on Facebook. So what happened is you can see this and, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to be able to read all of this, but Aeneas posted this 
on Facebook connecting over to Samantha. So she essentially sent her a, what is the equivalent of a text message via Facebook. And she explained that she's French, she lives in London, she gave her birth date, she said where she was from, um, and I think and it gives her a Korean name. And she's also a little cautious saying, I found out that you were also born on the same day as me, and I don't want to be uh, too Lindsay Lohan, which is a reference to the movie Parent Trap, where twins were separated at birth and they didn't know about it. But anyway, so you can see at the end, she says, let me know, don't freak out, lots of love. She'd never met her before. So after some back and forth, they decided to have a meeting on Skype. Skype is a way to do a video conference call. And this is a screenshot, essentially, of their very first meeting on Skype. And there was, I've seen this, and there is a movie that I'll be referencing in a bit where you can watch their whole story. But this was from their first meeting. So it turns out after this back and forth and the ability to figure out they had the same birth date and other things, they ultimately took a DNA test and found out they were in fact identical twins. So like any good millennials, they start documenting the whole story. They had the Facebook conversation, they had recorded their first Skype meeting, and they decided to make a movie. And here is the um, screenshot of kind of the movie poster, the promotional shot called Twinsters. And Kickstarter is a crowdsourcing, and I'll explain more about crowdsourcing later, but you can go online and say, hey, everybody, I have a project, and we're trying to raise money for a movie. So they did that. They shared it via social media, and you can see here that they had more than 1,200 backers who pledged more than $43,000 to help bring their project to life. So they did in fact make the movie. It was available on Netflix. I'm not sure it is still there, but if you Google Twinsters or maybe look on Netflix or Amazon Prime, it, it was just a really, really uplifting story and the girls were adorable and their giggles are infectious. So I really do recommend the movie. Here are some, some pictures of them and their family. Uh, in the top left, that's uh, Samantha's New Jersey family. I think that's the grandmother and she has two brothers. And then down on the right, you can see they're visiting Paris. Anyway, they're adorable and they never ever would have known that they had an identical twin if it were not for social media. So that's a happy story. I know, you know, the bad ones get in the news, but I had to start with something a little bit cheery. Okay, so let's, let's back up and talk about what social media is. Social media is, refers to any website or app run by a company that allows user to, users to contribute and view information. So the information, <clears throat> excuse me, comes from the users as opposed to the New York Times where the information comes from the journalists. So it is a social network, um, plain and simple. So since the advent of social media and really a lot of tech, we've seen new vocabulary. So this fascinates me just because there are new words being added to the dictionary now every year that are spreading partly because of social media, because otherwise you'd make up a word and you wouldn't really have a way to communicate it. So here are some of the, just the new terms that we've seen. They're not all social media, but most are. Um, the emoticon on the left, that's called an emoticon, and I think that's a symbol of a, uh, the smiley face laughing so hard, he or she is crying. And in 2015, Oxford Dictionary named that the word of the year, and it's not even a word. Tweet, which is the act of, of the, the output from Twitter when you write a tweet, that came about in 2006 when Twitter first came on the scene. The word blog is derived from web and log. That's a lot older, and that's really just an online journal. And then you hear a lot of times people talking about something going viral or trending. And that's simply an item on social media with many, many viewers. And then an old world word uh, is a selfie. I can't believe that's from 2002. It's making me realize how long um, all of this has been around. So every year there are new words and new terms. And I think that's one of the challenges. It's, it, it can make someone feel like an outsider if you don't know what those words are. So here are just a few of the, the social media sites that we're going to cover here. All right, so how do, you, how do you view social media sites? You can do it on a web browser, 
So you can go to, uh, you know, open Chrome or whatever you use and go to facebook.com or instagram.com. If you're using it on a smartphone or a tablet, a mobile device, chances are you will need to download an app. And that would be like downloading any app onto your device. You would go to the App Store or Google Play and look for Facebook or Instagram. Um, one thing I'll point out is that if you were using social media on the internet, on, on the web, on a browser, the functionality is going to look and feel different than on the app. And that's just the nature of, of apps, I suppose. All right, I'm going to go through some um, of the features, the common features of social media sites. Most, if not all, require you to set up an account. And that's because if you're gonna be posting information, they wanna know who you are, there are rules you have to agree to. Uh, and of course, they wanna hook you into the, the site because they sell advertising and the more wedded you are to using the site, the better off they are. So in order to, for you to upload your personal information that you might on a social media site, you have to have that account. In some cases, you can go in and view without an account. So Twitter, uh, you could go to twitter.com on your web browser and actually do a fair amount of browsing and searching without the account, but you will not be able to post anything unless you go through the setup process. And this is just from Pinterest and it's just the sign up page. Nothing, nothing too exciting about that. All right. Social media is social because people share information. So users who have an account have personalized public profiles. You can dial up or down the privacy settings so that people can see more or less about you, and I'll talk about that through each site as we go along. Um, in each case, you have to have a name, a username. Some sites require that you use your real name. So technically on Facebook, I would have to be Pam Holland. I could not be um, Snoopy or Linus Van Pelt or a made-up name. And there are ways, people get away with it. Um, you know, frequently actually you could make up a name and they wouldn't know, but believe it or not, they run algorithms to try to ferret out people who are not using the real name. And the exception for that is if you have a business, you can, you know, of course it can be the business name, um, but again, it's supposed to be real. The more you put in, the more likely it is that other people will be able to find you when they go online doing searches. So here, these are uh, screenshots from my Facebook. The one on the left is from the web browser. The one on the right is from um, my mobile phone. And you can see I have the picture in there. I put my maiden name, which is Shine, which actually helps people find me from my old life. Uh, some people choose not to do that. You can see down there I put in UMass, so friends from college might find me. The more private you want to be, the less information you want to have on your social media site. And each of the sites have a way that you connect with others. So Facebook is mutual. If someone friends me, I have to accept it. It's a handshake. It's mutual. It's called a friend. On Twitter, you refer to people you connect with as people you follow or they follow you. It's unilateral. It's sometimes considered polite if someone follows you to follow them back, but not required. And the same thing on Instagram. It would be following and, it, and it's unilateral. Each site promotes sharing of user curated content. If no one posts to social media, no one gets to see anything. Um, different sites have a different focus and we'll go through some of the, the differences as I go through each of the social media sites that I'm gonna feature today. And then privacy settings. <clears throat> There's really nothing more important than the privacy settings. If you're going to go on social media, understanding <clears throat> when you show something and it will show up as public and the world will see versus when it will just be your friends, that's all really important. Um, I highly recommend, you can do it. It's not, this is what trips a lot of people up. If you simply go into the settings, click on privacy is usually where you find it and just go through all the options. And doing it methodically and when you have some time to actually read through it all, it's not that it's not that difficult. And I recommend that people look at it periodically. I am in my privacy settings a lot because I'm teaching. And what tends to happen is I'll, it'll even be a few weeks and I'll go back through the privacy settings because I'm showing someone how to do it and, and I'll see some new feature. So they change frequently and you don't always get notification of that. So I recommend that people do it at least once a year, maybe every every six months. 
So newsfeed. Newsfeed goes by different terms, but in everybody's social media site, you're going to have information that comes from the users, the other users that you share. So this is an example. This is from my Twitter. And the box in what I have boxed in red, you can see uh, a tweet from someone named Sam Hermans, who I don't know, it came from somewhere else, but anyway, in IBM Watson Analytics. So if I scroll, I will continue to get more and more tweets from other people that I'm following. And you can see up on the right underneath where it says Tech Moxie, I'm following 478 people. So the tweets from 478 people will be showing up in the area with the red box. So that shows up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, there is this, it's the concept is, it's called a newsfeed. Um, although it goes by slightly different names in different sites. And then I would say each site has slightly different, un, I say unwritten rules of customs and etiquette. Just like if you go to a cocktail party, you know you're expected to dress a certain way, make small talk. There are some things, depending on where you are and who you're with, that you might talk about politics, you might not. There are the pleasantries you exchange. Uh, same thing, you, you run into someone in the supermarket. You're not gonna lift up your shirt and show them your gallbladder scar, scar. You just know these things and you know that you're gonna behave in a certain way. So when people get on social media, sometimes it takes a bit, but the best thing to do is to watch and see what other people do, and then you, you start to get the, the hang of it. Um, one, I'll just give you an example of one etiquette question. Uh, someone asked me recently if, you know, am I expected to see every Facebook post from all my friends? And the, the answer to that is no. Um, Facebook, for as one example, is very different from email. If someone sends you an email, you might miss an email, you might forget to respond, like I have done on occasion, but you, it, the expectation is that people see every email that comes into their inbox, unless they really are never on email. With Facebook, the expectation is not that you will see every post, you may miss things. So that usually makes people feel a lot more relaxed about going on because they are not taking on a, a huge social obligation. So if someone says to me, did you see the picture of my granddaughter on Facebook? It's perfectly okay to say, no, I haven't been there for a few days, but I'll go look. It does not mean that you missed something or you were a social derelict. So I just want to point that little one out. So now I'm going to dive into uh, some of the social media sites. This is called Vine, and Vine, I think, is actually shutting down. And I thought about whether I wanted to leave it in or take it out of the presentation. I think it's a great way to just see how silly things go viral. If you are on social media, you may have seen some of the ridiculous cat videos and dog videos that everybody loves, no matter how silly they are. So I just wanted to use this as an example for some of those um, some of those videos. Now I have to click out of this, so you'll have to forgive me, but I'm gonna, um, I didn't embed the video. So I'm gonna go into um, this bigger example first. And the audio should play. This is very silly. Uh, Vine is a six second looping video, so this will loop and then I'll stop it. That was a close one. That was a close one. All right. Notice here this number before I close out. And now I'll go back. All right, that went pretty well. I did. I found myself there. Um, that video was looped like 13 million times. Crazy. So someone made that video, posted it, and there it goes, and people watch it and laugh. So this one I want to show you next is was done by a neighbor of mine, a friend's daughter, and her name is Natalie, and she did this when she was, I think, a freshman. Um, so actually, I can talk while this is playing because Nat, uh, Natalie's doesn't have any sound. And she's just an adorable little kid, and she was not planning on having the cat bite her head. But you can see down here. Um, so John, I don't know if you can unmute. Can, is my cursor showing? Can I use that as a pointer? Um, but if you look down here, it has 79,000 likes, 58,000 revines, which means it was shared, and it was looped 3.5 million times. 
So Natalie did this. She posted it for her friends to see. And someone saw it. You know, there are people who get paid just to look for cute cat videos and things. And it was shared and be went viral. So that's an example of something going viral. And then she got an offer of money because it's her intellectual property. And there are companies that match up your IP with the people who are using your vine and kind of selling it and using it for advertising. So I don't want to go into that whole thing, but she signed a contract and made several thousand dollars from that vine for basically doing nothing and had no intention of it. So in interesting. Um, I just like that because it shows how it went from the beginning to, uh, to viral. All right. So now we're going to switch to, to Instagram. Instagram is really intended to be used on a mobile device on a phone. It is more and more popular with younger kids. People use it to share photos of their babies. They take pictures of what they eat. And it is a visual um, photography tool, really. It's not so much about text, although people do share that. And that's a picture of my dog that was posted by my daughter. Um, I like it because it's it's just a nice visual. It doesn't have as much of the garbage as you see on, on Facebook. And here is one of my son, and I like it because I can follow my kids. So Instagram, you follow people, it's not friends, it's not mutual. And I have this app, I open the app and I can scroll. I have a news feed similar to what I showed you on Facebook. Um, and that is Instagram. Just showing you silly pictures. Um, that is a squirrel that my son posted in Wyoming. And this is a woman I follow on Instagram because I she takes beautiful photographs of uh, sea life because she is in Monterey Bay. Um, completely random that I don't know her. I was looking for pictures of whales on Instagram because I was in Monterey Bay and I came uh, across her. So that was uh, Emma Hatton. And that's Instagram. It's very easy to use. If you are interested, I would download it on a, on a smartphone. You can use it online, but it's probably the one social media app that does not work very well uh, on, on the computer. In fact, you can't even upload a picture from the computer. You have to be on, on a mobile device. So this is Pinterest and Pinterest, I'm gonna go in a kind of a, a different direction with this. Pinterest comes from a combination of the word pin and interest. It's considered an online bulletin board. And people collect images from the web. Each picture here links to a website. And if I click on the picture, it would take me to the website where that photograph came from. So people tend to collect. You can curate your own content on Pinterest by creating something called boards. And, you know, my intention is not to teach you exactly how to use Pinterest, but to give you enough information to see how people are using these social media sites. So here you see knitting. Um, I did a search for knitting and it is eye candy. I could go through these pictures for hours and look at different things that I could knit. Um, let me see what, then I had these hats that I saw. So I could click once you, you search for knitting or it is visual, it's a way to curate and collect information from websites. And then there is a certain amount of interaction from the members of Pinterest who go back and forth and share things and like things and can comment on other, other posts. All right, here's one of the big daddies. This is uh, a screenshot from my Facebook. It shows a picture of me up in the corner and you can see um, another background uh, shot there. Why do I like Facebook? Uh, Facebook can be horrible. It can be um, a place where people just sit and post you know, information about what they had for lunch. The politics can get out of control um, all over the place. So it has its pluses and minuses. For me, it's a wonderful social tool. It's a way to stay connected to friends and family who I don't see. I am horrible about picking up the phone and calling someone that I haven't seen in 10 years. But with Facebook, I've been able to re reconnect with friends from high school that I've lost touch with. In fact, this is my friend, uh, Kathy, who this is an old picture, but she has a great sense of humor and she bought these 
tiki towers. I don't even know what they are. She probably put them in her backyard. She lives in Florida. And as silly as this is, this allows me to kind of have this little window into her life and share a laugh. So I love it for that. I think it can also be a huge time suck. I think, you you know, I got my husband on Facebook because I thought he would enjoy connecting with some uh, old high school friends. And now I can't get him off of Facebook. So it has its pluses. It has its minuses. Now what we're seeing is Facebook is really being used uh, for social change, for better and for worse, depending on on your point of view. There was a huge problem, and there still is, I think, with fake news. So this is evolving, um, and I think it will continue to change, of course, over the next couple of years. Um, but in particular, I think Facebook is being more mindful of what gets posted in terms of fake and not fake. So we'll see. This is, uh, of course, a work in progress. This is a group. I was an attorney in, in D.C. at Fannie Mae, uh, the mortgage company that may, many of you have probably heard of. Uh, someone recently decided to start a, a group for anyone who had previously worked at Fannie Mae. So this is another tool that Facebook is good for. Someone created a closed group which means you have to be invited. It's not like, you know, you have to apply for membership. But this way, we're not going to have people who had nothing to do with Fannie Mae just coming in and trying to get personal information. So this is the group I get to find out about um, people having grandkids. And unfortunately, I've learned that some of our colleagues have passed. Um, but it's fun. And it is a really, really great way to connect virtually with a, a bunch of people that I enjoyed very much working with. So people use Facebook these groups for political reasons. They use them if they're planning a reunion with family. There are a lot of great uses for, for the Facebook groups. Okay, Ravelry. Um, I don't know if we have any knitters in, in the audience, and I am not sharing this because I think you all need to be knitting, but I think this is a great use of social media. This is a site for knitters, not just to be social, but to share information in a way. It's called crowdsourcing, and I'll talk, I'm going to give you some more examples of crowdsourcing, but people are putting in data into Ravelry about things that they make. And I'm going to give you an example here. So this is a pattern for something called the hitchhiker scarf. And if you look at the bottom right, it was made 23,000 times. It's 23,000 plus projects. And because of that, you can actually go in and look at those projects and see how other people's projects turned out. So if you want to see if someone used a certain brand of yarn, you can research that. And it just because everybody just puts in this little bit of data, you have this rich resource um, from, from what is essentially the crowdsourcing or the crowd sharing. It little, little bits of people, little bits of information being put in by a lot of people. So that same concept is being used in medical research where people might put in bits of data about a disease or a syndrome and it allows scientists and others to look at it as a whole and to draw conclusions and to try to extrapolate from that data. So I, I just think Ravelry is a great example of how that's used. So crowdsourcing, I just mentioned a bit. It's so I call it social media with an ask, obtaining needed services from a large group of people, all just doing a little bit to help. It's also used sometimes to subdivide tedious work. It's used for fundraising. This is what happened with the Twinster movie. They crowdsourced the fundraising. They got a lot of people to put in a little bit of, of information. So now I'm hoping I'll keep a close eye on my internet, but I'm going to hope that I don't get bumped off for some weird reason. The first thing I'm going to show you, it's, I'll click because there's no audio. It's called Super Single, the Single Lane Super Highway. This artist, I'll move my cursor, this artist asked people to draw a car that would work facing in a right direction, going right, and he put these different cars on this road. And I think there are more than 50,000 different cars that he's displayed on this road. So we could sit here for like probably four hours and not see the same car twice, but I won't do that to you. And I, I'm putting my cursor over it so you can see people named their car. And, I, you know, what is this good for? Probably not much, but it's still really fascinating to me that it was used in art. All right, I have one more. In fact, I think what I'm going to do, because I already opened it, I'm going to go straight here. 
This is a virtual choir, which will become apparent in a minute. There is audio. The composer is Eric Whitaker, and he asked people to audition and submit video singing a certain piece of music that I believe he composed. He put the videos together, and what you're seeing is his production. And I'll, I'm going to be quiet for a moment. I'm not going to let this run for too long. watch that for a while. We'll go back to this. Um, he actually did that same type of setup and he did it live. I think he was using Skype. I'm not sure, but I, I mean, it's, it's hard enough for me to stay connected to you guys um, on my own, you know, internet. I cannot even imagine trying to do that production live. But anyway, he is a composer and um, that was, that was pretty fascinating. All right. Now we will go to, uh, so this is the last site that I'm going to talk about, and I left the most time for, I'll try to leave time for questions at the end, Twitter. Uh, Twitter, of course, is getting a lot of play right now. I hear they're not doing so well financially. I'm not sure if that's going to change with uh, the current administration using it to tweet out um, stuff from the White House, but we'll see. It is known as a microblogging site. Tweets are limited to 140 characters, which is a challenge to write in such a short little blip. Uh, you can also, though, add links and photo and video. The links count towards 140 characters, but they get um, automatically shortened by Twitter. So I'm going to talk about the hashtag for a moment, and then I will mention it a few more times because I think it's, it's the simplest thing, but also kind of hard to understand at the same time. The hashtag is something you will see in a tweet, and I'm going to go through an example of a tweet, but it is a pound sign that comes before the tweet, before a word, and it helps users find tweets on a particular topic. Essentially, when you see the hashtag before a word, it means that that hashtag and the word are the topic. It's kind of like a topic sentence, like the, the way a capital letter indicates a proper noun. It's not made up by the use. It's made up by users, not by Twitter. So I'll I'll show you more about that and come back again. Um, examples. So if you were going to be talking about nursing in a tweet, you the profession of nursing, you might do hashtag nursing. If you are, and you might want to do this for one of the virtual conferences, you can create a hashtag for the conference. You can see here, this was a conference, I think it was from 2015 for the North Carolina School Library Media Association. And that way people could tweet about the conference. It's used for social and political. Black Lives Matter started as a hashtag. Um, and I'm going to, I'll go through. I think it'll make more sense when we actually see it. So here is the um, Washington Nationals Twitter page. Uh, I'm here in DC, so I use this as an example. Um, this is a tweet from the Nationals, and I'm going to go through each part of the tweet so you can see that I've kind of blown this up. Um, that is the logo. It's a photo or avatar. It's no different than seeing somebody's Facebook profile photo. This is the Twitter name. Sometimes people call it a Twitter handle. The official name, Twitter name for the Nationals is at Nationals. So you can see that at the bottom of the red box. So if you wanted to tweet a message to someone, and I'll show you a little bit more about that, you would put in the tweet at Nationals, and that person would then see the tweet. The blue, the blue circle with the white check means that it's a verified account, and that's really important if you're on um, 
on the Twitter account for someone who's well known, because how do you know you're really on the president's or the White House Twitter feed or on a satire, a satirical account, or on just simply a fraudulent account? So if you're looking at the account for someone who's well known, you should look for that blue check right there. And this entire text and the hashtag and the link, this is the tweet. Everything in here counts towards the 140 character limit. This is a link. So the, the Nats had a jack-o'-lantern con contest, and they wanted people to go online and vote for their favorite. So what you can see circled in red is the link. It doesn't look like a normal link. That would go to WashingtonNationals.com backslash whatever, and it would probably be 140 characters all by itself. So Twitter will automatically take the, a long link and convert it to an abbreviated link. So that's what you, say, you see here. And this is the hashtag. So it is often just used in the middle of a sentence, and it denotes the fact that th that's the topic of this tweet. So other people, if you wanted to see all of the Natso Lantern tweets on Twitter, you would go to Twitter, and in the search box, you could put hashtag Natso Lantern, and it would bring that up. Okay, this is just to show you my face, my Twitter uh, account and what that looks like. That's my Twitter logo. It's a little different from my regular logo um, because it's smaller. For everyone's personal Twitter page, this is mine. Um, this is kind of old now, but it shows how many tweets I had. I had at the time I had 132. I was following 326 people. That means I had clicked follow. I wanted to see their tweets. And I had 125 people following me. So there's a lot of information on there. And you can see down here, this is what I would call biographical information. I don't have to have this. Some people with, with their personal Twitter accounts put nothing. Some people put a little description of what their interests are. That is all optional. And on Twitter, you don't have to use your real name. So um, this is my business name. I could I have a Twitter account that's Pam Holland, but you could also completely make up a name. And if it's not being used by someone else, it's yours. And here is a tweet. You can see um, I don't have a hashtag or a link in there. This is what was from a, a gala that I went to, and I was able to post the photo. And the photo doesn't count at all towards the 140 characters. If you went on my Twitter. Tech Moxie or anybody's and you wanted to, to follow me, you would click the follow button and then all of the, my tweets would then show up in your newsfeed. All right, so how is Twitter used? I think um, a lot of people want to be on Twitter these days but not tweet and that is perfectly reasonable. There are a lot of interesting things out there on Twitter. But let's say you are, you are a Twitterer um, people go to conferences and they tweet from the event. So people might tweet, um, I am, you know, learning about social media. This was, you know, one of the things I learned today. I mean, I'm using more words than you would be able to use. Uh, people go to scientific conferences and tweet information that they're gaining from the conference. So that's one way it's used. A really popular way, though, is the second one I have listed, which is communicating with businesses. So, and I'll give you an example. I have a couple of screenshots of tweeting at Verizon, or you could tweet at an Airlines US Air. You can do it to complain, and it is actually very effective. So you would go on the Twitter account for Verizon, and I'll show you an example. And you can say, hey, the cable guy didn't show up this morning. Um, what gives? And you will pretty almost much instantly get a response back saying, oh, let us help you. Here, call this number. And what happens is the, the businesses have to monitor Twitter 24-7 now to make sure that they are staying on top of their customer service. So that is a big burden for, um, for businesses. Researching subject matter. I use Twitter all the time. I study accessibility and technology. What are the features that make um, an iPhone or a Samsung easier to see and use for someone who has a disability? And that's often a hashtag called like a hashtag accessibility. And I find I get better 
more precise information sometimes on Twitter than I do if I go onto a website. So it's, it's great for that. Breaking news, you, you know, there's nothing quite like um, seeing a tweet coming from uh, the current president directly from his Twitter account when it happens, and then everyone starts talking about it. There may be other news that released on Twitter before it would be released on a website or the radio or even an email alert. So people do use it for breaking news, national, international, but also local. I recently had the experience of seeing smoke rising from an airport nearby and was concerned that there was a plane crash because it was a lot of smoke and a lot of fire. And it was happened to have been BWI Airport. I went on Twitter, I searched BWI Airport, and immediately got a tweet that said, hey, we're doing a test today. Don't worry about it if you see smoke or fire. It was, it was pretty amazing how quickly that worked. All right, so again, one more time on that hashtag. It's a form of punctuation. Um, it really just denotes the, the fact that you're talking about a certain subject matter. And one of the reasons it's important too is that search engines don't distinguish between, they're not case sensitive. So the hashtag helps that. So here's another example of that Natso Lantern. You can see in the upper right, I searched Natso Lantern with that hashtag, and I it returned search results that were all of these tweets. And I'm gonna, I'm just trying to make sure I leave a few minutes for questions because I know we're getting towards the end here. Here is an example of a tweet that I made, and if you can see here, it's at VZWS support. That is Verizon support Twitter account. So when you want to talk to someone on Twitter, you start a tweet, you start writing the tweet, and you put in the name of the Twitter account that you want to reach. So here, I put in their Twitter name, and I wrote, voice mailbox gets full after a few messages. How can it be fixed? And you can see my sentences are abbreviated because I had to fit this in 140 characters. And then I got a response back um, the next day. It wasn't the same day. Uh, let's take a look and review and see what you can do, you know, what we can do. And it says, send us a DM. That's a direct message. That's a way to private message them and see what we can get started. And then you can see below there's an asterisk, an AZC, and that's just the initial of whoever was helping me. All right. I forgot I had marked all that, and I'm just about at the end. One more. Uh, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. There was an incident in my neighborhood. I was trying to figure out what had happened. I sent them a text and I got a response. And this is not considered <laughs> um, a, a bad use of resources. They answer these all day long. All right, let me just scroll through that. And another example, US Airways. Do you respond to customer treat tweets? Just wondering. And I got a response back uh, same day, happy to do it. They said, I have heard people will actually be at the airport and if a flight is delayed, they will tweet the airline and sometimes get better information than they will at the counter. I find that a little difficult to believe, but um, a number of people have told me that. Why do I, sorry guys, I keep forgetting I have circled those. And that's it. So I think, I hope we have a couple minutes for questions. I see I've seen him lighting up. Hopefully I've answered some along the way. Yeah, you, you did one because somebody was wanting to know about being able to just follow tweets and not being required to contribute tweets. And right. And said that you can. I know that they've had things where people don't like people who just follow Facebook and never take part in it. Right. And, and I will say, I am a firm believer that you use social media how you want. I have friends on Facebook that never comment, never post, but I know that they're reading my, my post because sometimes they'll say, oh, I heard you, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's okay. You know, I think the world is filled with introverts and extroverts and you, you have to own your, your own self and, you know, not let people guilt you into posting when you're not comfortable. Yeah. Got another one. Uh, somebody wanted to know, how do you find the tweet name of a company if you don't know what that would be? So the way I do it is there is a search window. And if you, I'm going to, while I'm talking, can I, I'm just going to go out to my Twitter. And if we run out of time, we run out of time. But I am going to go to Twitter. Um, and you'll see there's a search box. So up here. And John, you can see this, right? Yep. So good. I'm going to look for uh, New York Times. And you can see this, the search results start showing 
all the things that have New York in them and New York Times was the first one. And you can see also that it has the check. So by doing a search is the best way to do that. Um, I will, I'm going to look for my son. I put in Mike <laughs> because I probably, because I follow him. That is his. So, it, you know, it's like searching for anything online. You have to tweak, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we uh, like the idea about the uh, Twitter and uh, we may find that for future VTCs. Uh, one last thing real quick, because people can still post and we'll get them to you later. Uh, if you're using Facebook, what's the best way to limit who sees your post? Um, I want to show you something important on Facebook. I think this is really critical. So you want to go through all of the privacy settings. But, and, and I apologize, my Facebook is alive with political stuff and I'm not going to, I can't, I can't do anything about that nor do I really want to necessarily. Um, so here's Facebook and right here, this is a, an ad, but when you see this, that means that this post is public. If I comment on it down here, my response is also going to be public. So if I have something, um, all right, here's my friend Paul posted something about a fox. His post has this icon. It's only been shared with his friends. So what you want to do is make sure every time you write something that you have this icon, not a world icon. And I'll go back up. So here's where I can post. I had it set to only me just because I was teaching. But normally this would be friends. And that would be mean that if I post, only my friends would get that post. If I set it to world, anybody, including any of you on this call, could search my name on Facebook and find my post. That's not what I want. You know, I want it, I want it to be limited. But there are other um, settings up here that you need to go into down here. Um, you click on settings, and then it'll take you to privacy. And you just have to go through it step by step. Last question that I'm going to ask, even though we're just about, you know, time is, so some people will be able to sleep tonight. If you post something in error or foolishly, can you get it out of there? Or yes. Is it, yes. Uh, you can delete it now. Um, and I will show you one of, let's see, hopefully. All right. You're going to get to see my political cartoon. But um, right up here, this is something I posted. You can click up there and you can see I can edit it. And all right, this is not a regular post, but there's usually a delete button. I wanted to show you, I had a picture of my dog in there. I was going to use that one because <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of politics. Um, right here, edit. And there is delete. Same thing on Twitter. You can go back in and delete. Now, if you've done something really terrible, you know, if you're um, a celebrity and you posted something because you were drunk and it was inappropriate, someone will take a screenshot of it. So, mm. but for normal people like us who are not so interesting, yes, you can go in and delete and edit. Well, great. Pam, as always, thank you so much for <clears throat> being willing to share your expertise with us. Um, I think that a lot of people might be feeling more comfortable about getting started in this. And uh, put, if you would, please put your uh, last slide back up with your uh, contact information. Uh, and then there were a few more questions, but uh, Judy will get those to you and then you can respond to that. Okay, I'm happy so, to do that. And I just want to say only because this is public, I put info at TechMoxie. I can also be reached uh, at Pam at TechMoxie. Great. So feel free. Thank you, everybody. It's great.